Well, good evening, everyone. We're glad to have you tonight. Welcome you online. We welcome you that are here. Thank you for taking the time. I know for many of you, you've worked, but I thank you for your willingness to be here. Thank you. It's uh, really great to have everyone here tonight. I would like to start off a little differently with a message, and then we're going to end time tonight with communion. And if you're at home and you would like to be a part of our communion service, just now get up, grab some juice, grab a piece of bread somewhere, and we can be able to share uh, later on just a little bit of time. This is not going to be a long service, but it's nice to see so many people, and it's nice to see some people that are newer here and uh, under, you know, stress and difficult circumstances, and we pray this is a very meaningful service tonight. I want you to be able to be in the Gospel of John, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the fourth book of the New Testament, and then we're going to read an extended passage from the first book of the Old Testament, the very first book of Scripture in Genesis. So if you want to be able to get to the book of Genesis, and then you want to be able to read from the Gospel of John as well. What I want to be able to do tonight, and by the way, there may be somebody here tonight that's, uh, that's uh, very interested, and you may not know much about Jesus, or you've known about Jesus, but you're questioning it, or you may be at home, and you may be thinking to yourself, you know, inquiring minds want to know, and I'm not quite sure about even the, um, the factual historicity of Jesus. We're going to post a little um, link for you, and we'll do it sometime soon, hopefully, that will be able to let you see and be able to go and read this article that shows that there are multiple old uh, accounts, not Christian, because, well, obviously, the Bible is going to talk about the reality of Jesus, but there are multiple non-Christian sources that are Greek, that are Jewish, that re refer to the reality and the life and death of Jesus. So we're going to post that article for you. That's not the title or topic of our message tonight, but I know some of you may be at home and thinking to yourself, I don't know much about Good Friday or Easter but I want to investigate the claims of Jesus. This might be a good article to start, and we're going to put it in the comment section, and when you guys go home, you can surely take a look at it yourself if you want to. But tonight, what I want to be able to do is look at something that we oftentimes don't look at in Scripture, and that is something below the surface, and that is what John and what the gospel writers, but particularly John, says about who Jesus is and what he did. And so oftentimes, we just look and go, some way, somehow, God got angry and took out his vengeance on his son who was willing to take the beating, and somehow we're forgiven, and when we die, we're going to go to heaven. Now, some parts of that are, are right, but there's a lot more under the surface to what Jesus did for us. And I think it's very important that we look at the Gospel of John particularly and to see what has happened and to see what John has to say about all those. So if you want to turn to the 19th chapter of John, and I'm going to set a little bit of a stage here and set a little bit of an idea for all of us, and I want us to be able to take a look at this and say to ourselves, I never considered this. I never knew this is what was going on. So if you want to take a look at the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the fourth book, and chapter 19, I'm going to read about 16 verses here, and then we're going to take a look at the first book of the Old Testament, Genesis, of so just a second. Then Pilate took Jesus. Now, Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane Thursday. He was taken to captivity. He was flogged and beaten all Thursday night, leading into early Friday morning. And now we come and we see this whole sense of which now coming to the reality of the crucifixion. Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went out uh, and went up again and again and said to Jesus, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you, and I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out, he was wearing a crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, here is the man. That's the first thing I want you to hold to. Here's the man. As soon as the chief priests and the officials saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, 
I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace with Jesus. Where do you come from, he said to Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Don't you realize I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus said, you would have no, you would have no power over me if it were not for the one that gave power from above. Verse 12, from then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. Think about that. Anyone who claims to be a king. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat on the judge's seat at a place known, and this is Aramaic, uh, it's known as the stove, uh, stone pavement in Aramaic, it's, it's uh, Golbatha. Don't worry about that, but that's just the reality of Jesus spoke in the everyday language of his people, which was Aramaic, as well as, you know, as well as what the Old Testament in Hebrew, and then much of the New Testament is in Greek. But at Jesus' time, he spoke Aramaic. Here is your king. Remember that. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to be crucified. John's gospel is filled with double meanings all the way through it. And here, Pontius Pilate is making pitiful statements about Jesus. He's, he's bringing him out, half dead, beaten so bad he can hardly even walk. And he's saying, here's this man. Here's this pitiful man. Here's this pitiful king. And he's making fun. He's making these statements in jest and mockery. But John is saying something much deeper than just what Pilate is saying. Jesus is then crucified. He's put on the cross at 9 a.m. in the morning. At noon, we see it at the sun, whatever may happen. There are different uh, theories for that, whether there was an eclipse. There's actually a historical statement that says that. But at 3 o'clock, he breathes his last, and he dies. See, he dies on the day of preparation for the Sabbath. We can turn, if you want to, to John chapter, same chapter, but if you want to go to verse 41 and 42, I'll just read it. It's not on the screen for you. But all at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. Remember that. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The day of preparation is Friday. So, uh, the Sabbath happens on Saturday in Jewish time. That was the, the ritual and the custom at the time. So when you start with... Um, when you start with Sunday, if you will, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, that's the sixth day. Now, the sixth day is important because John is making a point here. It's not just the day of preparation, but it's the sixth day of the week. And some of you may be saying to yourself, whoa, that harkens back to another sixth day. And let me just read that for you. If you want to go back to uh, Genesis and you want to turn there, I'm just going to read an extended passage there, and hopefully when I get done, you'll be able to start seeing John is making a greater point in this whole thing. So we're going to be in John, uh, we're going to be in Genesis, the first book of the Old Testament, chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 24. You guys with me here? And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, wild animals, and so it was, verse 25, God made the wild animals according to their kinds, livestock, all, everything that moved around. God saw that it was good. Verse 26, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move on the ground. Verse 27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. 
Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea, birds in the sky, every living creature. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. Look at this, verse 31. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And what day is this? And then it was evening, and then morning, the sixth day. See, John saw that Jesus, in this whole process, as he's writing this gospel letter, he sees Jesus as bringing about new creation, and he writes his gospel in that fashion. The gospel of John, if you, who, who thinks and who, this is my favorite gospel, because it has so many great passages in it, right? For God so loved the world, right? I am the resurrection and the life, all these different passages. But oftentimes we don't realize that John is saying that through Jesus, God is making a new creation. That when in an initial creation, on the sixth day, God made man, Jesus was there. He wasn't named Jesus. He was the second person of the Trinity, the Word. But we see that Jesus was surely there. And now we see through Jesus, mankind is being renewed again. And it's interesting for us to see in the Gospel of John how much he mimics Genesis. Let me give you a few. We hear and we read in the very beginning of Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, what? God created. How does the Gospel of John begin? In the beginning was the Word, right? And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God, what? In the beginning. Look at John 19, verse 28. It's part of this passion of Jesus. Later, knowing that everything had been finished and so that the Scripture will be fulfilled, don't miss that point. John is saying, I'm going all the way back to the very beginning of time in Scripture. Jesus said what? I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked the sponge in it, put a sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. What does he say? When he had received the drink, what's he do? Jesus says, it is finished. What did God say after all creation was done? It is finished, and it is good. John saw that Jesus in his death was making it possible for creation to be seen again. I just, I just threw together, and this is a rough, you can't hardly see it, but hopefully at home you can take a look. Yeah, it's so, so bad. You're saying, my word, Sean, i got to have perfect vision to see this. But you can see the two columns, one from Genesis and then the Gospel of John. And what John is doing is he's saying, through Jesus, new creation is happening. In the beginning, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning was the world, I just said that. God made mankind. Then we see how this Jesus dies on the sixth day. Mankind was made on the sixth, Jesus died on the sixth to renew it. God finished his work. Jesus said, it is finished. Man and woman in the garden, what did we just read? Jesus was laid in the garden tomb. And it was in the garden tomb that the power of God was going to raise him, almost as if to say, through Jesus in the garden, he was restoring all that God wanted to be done in life. And we can go on and go on with this. God rested on what day? The seventh day, Saturday. Jesus will be in the tomb on the seventh day tomorrow. He will be resting. And what happens? On the first day of the week, Jesus will be raised to new life. And I just want you to understand tonight that when you come and see this, Jesus sees that in Jesus' death, he's making it possible for mankind to be to be able to live a different way, a new way to be human is the way I want to say it to us. Through Jesus, we find new creation. When Pilate said, here is the man and here is the king, he said that in jest and mockery, but John was saying a much greater truth to us. Jesus reestablished what it meant to be a real human being. 
Adam and Eve couldn't do it. The nation of Israel couldn't do it. God always wanted to work through people to steward his creation well. But from Adam and Eve all the way through, the people of God, even through the judges and all the kings, they fell all the time. And yet John is saying through Jesus, mankind has been restored. Here is the real person. Here is a real human being. And because he is a real human being, he is able and he's the only one that can die our death. Amen to that? That's the truth that I want you to see tonight. The real human, Jesus, came and died our real death because of what the power, not just of our sins, but the power of evil and the dark forces that were behind our sins. Only Jesus, the real human, could do that for us and take our place. And we come to Jesus, and we find our life and our identity in him we find a whole new way to be human in our life. And let me just share with somebody who was teetering on the edge of really coming to faith in Jesus, and you're saying, I'm scared of what that will mean. I want to say this to you. When you know and trust Jesus, you don't lose anything. You gain what it means to really be a human being. Jesus says to us, oftentimes, in different ways, but if you give your trust and your hope in Jesus, friend, you won't lose anything. You will begin to find out what life is all about. John chapter 5, or John chapter 12. Let's look there just for a second. This is one of those paradoxes. It's an irony to look at this, but this is exactly what happens. And if you're thinking about following Jesus, if you're thinking about what that really entails, look at what he says to us tonight. John chapter 12, verse 23. Jesus replied, and this is right before his crucifixion, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. See, if you try to keep your life, and you be the person who sets the agenda for your life, as many people think they can do, you'll lose what it really means to be a real human being. But if you're willing to die to yourself and trust that Jesus, the real human who died your death, he can give you the life that you're always looking for if you're willing to lay your life down. Amen to that? Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world for me will keep it for eternity. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Mm. My soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this very reason I came into this well, I came into this world, but I came for this hour. And what's he saying? Verse 28. Father, glorify your name through me. And then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify your life. And the crowd was there and heard it and said it was like thunder. Others says an angel had spoken. This is such an important part for us to understand because in John's gospel, God is most glorified when his son gives his life. And for us tonight on Good Friday, Jesus' words to us are true. If you're willing to lay your life down, God will glorify your life. He will be willing to glorify your life. And that's the truth I want us to see tonight. If you're willing to live for Jesus and you're willing to live and trust and, I, and want to have the character of Jesus in your life, by the power of Jesus living through you by his spirit, God says, if you're willing to lay your life down and allow me to pick your life back up in my way, God says to us, I will glorify your life. Your life will be a good life, a life well lived, and I will glorify your life. And I think most of us at the end of our life want to be able to look back and say, somehow, some way, 
I put my life at the disposal of God, and he used my life for his purposes. What does it gain a person if they gain the whole world, right, and yet lose the things of the soul? And Jesus says, if you're but willing to lay your life down, I have come to make new creation, and I will make your life, and I'll glorify you. And on this Good Friday, when Jesus laid his life down for all mankind, I hope none of us are here tonight saying to yourself, I have this picture of Good Friday that this angry God takes out his whole vengeance on Jesus. Friend, Jesus comes to absorb all of our sins and the evil of this world, and you know what the motivation behind it is? The love of God. God the Father doesn't take his vengeance out on his son. God the Father takes his vengeance out on the sin that has caused the problems of this world. God condemns sin in the flesh and the body of Jesus, but he doesn't condemn his son. Jesus comes, and don't think that Jesus was somehow had to be tied up and drugged to the cross. He came for that purpose, didn't he? As for this hour I have come, he came in love, and he was willing to absorb all of your sins and mine and of the whole world, past, present, and future. And he's willing to take on him the most hellish, intense evil of life. And that demonstration of his love broke the back of evil and brought forgiveness to all of us. Amen to that? Amen. That's what Good Friday is about, the love of God. The love of God conquering all of our own needs and the evil of this world. That's what Good Friday is all about. And on this Good Friday, when Jesus laid his life down in that fashion, friend, let us lay our lives down. Seek to be truly human beings through his grace and power in our life and help us to rely upon him and ask for his spirit to change and transform us. And may we go to people in humility and in love and help them to understand as Jesus has loved me, so I want to learn to love you. And I want my life at the very end to be lived for the glory of Jesus in my life. Amen to that? Amen. That's what Jesus wanted for his heavenly Father, and may we be the same way in our life. Jesus, when the last breath of my life is done on this earth, may people not look to me, may they see you, Jesus, in me and bring glory to the heavenly Father. Amen to that? That's what we should have in our mind tonight because Jesus did that for us on the cross. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks. Help us to understand that when you came and you gave your life, you came to renew all of creation. When you said it is finished, just like in the very beginning, your love broke the back of evil, and your love forgave each one of us everything in our life. Praise your name, Jesus. We give you thanks. May we live for you, Jesus. And we have your promise that if we're willing to lay our life down and live for that purpose of yours, Jesus, you will glorify our life and bring great glory to you. That's what we want. We're thankful for your grace, Jesus. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. Janie, come on up, would you please? And I know you've heard this, and I know this is one of those songs that I've heard this so many times. Come on up, Janie. But I think it's very appropriate for us, appropriate for us on Good Friday to hear the song about God's amazing grace because that's exactly what Good Friday is all about. Amen? Amen.
if you have these communion kits. I'll give you just a moment. I thought the other ones were hard to get into. These are like Fort Knox to try to get into the juice. I'll give you a moment, and if you're at home, just get up and get some bread and some juice. And I just want us to be able to come tonight and say, Lord Jesus, make me a true human. Help me to lay down my own agenda in my own ways. And Jesus, may you make me a new human being, a man, a woman, a young woman, a, young, a child, a teenager. Jesus, help me to know what it really means to live. In some small way, help my life to be shaped by your amazing grace. Jesus' body was broken for you and for me. And as he did with his early followers, he says to us tonight, take and receive this bread as a symbol of my body broken for you. Take and receive, church. Take and receive it. death and the grave and all the dark forces of evil and the evil one thought that they had had Jesus pinned and through Pilate and those around the cross Jesus come down off that cross You can't even save yourself, Jesus. That's exactly right. And through his emptying of himself, he broke the very power of death and the grave and the evil forces, and Satan had nothing more to bring to Jesus. In the worst moment of history, Jesus and his love overcame it all. Amen to that? This, his blood shed for you and me to preserve us blameless and to give us the hope of a renewed way of living, a real human way of living our life. Take and receive, knowing that one day Jesus will come again to not only make your body new, but he will make this whole world new again. Let's take and receive. Lord Jesus, we're thankful for your love and your grace. Take our lives and let them be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Amen. Amen. Amen.